car crashes, defective products, dangerous drugs, injuries, and abuse. Across the state of Alabama, the attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. Your tough legal questions answered by our experts with the attorneys of Hollis Wright. Hello, I'm Art Franklin. Welcome to The Attorney. So glad that you're joining us for another edition. As we get started, I want to remind you that you can get in contact with one of the attorneys from Hollis Wright right now, and the call is free, it's confidential. All you have to do is call 1-844-LAW-TALK. On this edition of the show, we're talking about criminal law. We've got a very special guest. Glad to have Hunter Horton joining us and Carter Clay. Um, this is a show that, that really a lot of people need to hear from. Oh, yeah, there are a lot of individuals out there that are either facing criminal charges or they have family members, friends, or loved ones that are facing criminal charges. So Hunter's here to provide a wealth of information to the viewers about really what I would characterize as some of the most common questions that people have or that individuals have who are confronting uh, criminal charges or have family members confronting criminal charges. So Hunter, welcome to the show. Carter, it's a, I really appreciate you guys having me on. Uh, I think this, this show is really a, a fantastic way uh, for attorneys to communicate directly to the public on, on issues that uh, folks face on a on a day-to-day -day basis. So thank you for having me. Well, you're welcome. And of course, I know Victor Revel. Victor's been a guest on the show uh, before, and he's quite entertaining. Uh, he, he's very articulate. And one thing you can say about Victor is, is he's very passionate about the work that he does in representing individuals charged with crimes. So you do have some big shoes to fill here today. And the reason I mentioned Victor is is you work with Victor, correct? That's right, Carter. I've uh, I've worked with Victor since I've been since I've been in practice, and I can tell you that that uh, that passion that he carries, that that drive and fire he has for for representing people that have been accused of of, of crimes, uh, it, it has a trickle down effect in our office. Yeah, um, and well, it's it's shared by the firm at large. Yeah, well, he's a great person to work from. So let uh, work for. So let's just jump right into it. One one of the most common questions that we hear in the realm of criminal law is that the p the police want to speak speak with me. Uh, should I do it? So oftentimes the police are maybe investigating a situation or an occurrence and they want to talk to an individual about what they know and what happened. So should the person talk to the police? Well, you know, that can, that can be a very complicated question. Um, the first thing that I think uh, needs to be understood is the Fifth Amendment protects you against self-incrimination, which means a person uh, accused of a crime does not have to speak to the police if they uh, choose to not do so. The uh, main piece of advice that I could give someone who the police want to speak to and uh, uh, is subject of an investigation is you need to consult with an attorney first uh, and really have that attorney present when you do, uh, should you choose to have that interview with the police to make sure that your rights are protected and to make sure that uh, what you're saying and the information you're providing uh, isn't mistaken or doesn't come off wrong um, because uh, false confessions happen every day. Um, and when they do happen, they can they can lead to very serious uh, very serious consequences. And, and if you claim the Fifth Amendment privilege, in other words, you refuse to talk to the police about a particular incident, am I correct that your claim of the Fifth Amendment privilege could not be used against you in any way in some downstream trial against you? Is that correct? That's absolutely correct, Carter. In fact, if if you claim that Fifth Amendment privilege and elect not to uh, speak with law enforcement. Right. In the event of a trial, no one can comment on that, and a jury cannot hold that against you as evidence of your guilt. Right. Now, I do think we need to distinguish what you just said, because sometimes people, uh, I have found, can take that answer to an extreme. And what I'm talking about is in situations where police stop you on the street or they pull you over in your car, when they come up to you and say, hey, what is your name? Can I see your driver's license? You can't just refuse to provide them that information, can you? That's correct. I mean, you can't assert your Fifth Amendment privilege from pr providing them anything, right? <laughs> That's correct, Carter. Okay. If, if you're behind the wheel of a car, uh, you know, an officer's going to ask you license, registration, insurance. This is information that you do have to provide for law enforcement. When I'm talking about that Fifth Amendment privilege, I'm talking about 
about more uh, if a law enforcement officer asks you to you know, come down to the police station, come down to the sheriff's department, uh, talk to us, there's a situation where you may be uh, um, a suspect in a crime. Right. But it can also apply even in situations where you get pulled over if you're suspected of driving under the influence. For instance, you've got to give them your name, your driver's license, and cooperate with them to that extent. But then you can draw a line there if they ask you to step out of the car, participate in a field sobriety test, maybe even participate in a breathalyzer, you can call time out and refuse to do those activities, correct? That's absolutely correct. Uh, the Fifth Amendment does, again, provide against self-incrimination. Field sobriety test, breathalyzer. Uh, when, you're under, when you've been pulled over on suspicion of driving under the influence, these are situations where you do not have to provide that information because of that Fifth Amendment right. However, it is very important for people to, to be aware of the fact, um, it, should you choose not to do the breathalyzer, let's say, um, while you don't have to, there are consequences. Each and every one of us that drives a motor vehicle in Alabama that has a driver's license, we are subject to something called implied consent. Not a lot of people know about this. When you go to the DMV and get that license, you are consenting to do that breathalyzer if you've been pulled over on suspicion of DUI. Now, you don't have to, but if you choose and tell the officer, I'm not going to do field sobriety, I'm not going to do the breathalyzer, the consequences of that refusal are going to be a license suspension. On the first refusal, uh, it's going to be 90 days. 90 day suspension automatic. Here's what is very important. Um, let's say you refuse the license you get a letter in the mail, or I'm sorry, refuse the breathalyzer, you get a letter in the mail saying your license has been suspended. That is not automatic. You have 10 days from the receipt of that letter to request a hearing on the issue, okay? The hearing basically consists of uh, the person accused, a hearing officer, this normally happens at uh, local uh, state police um, stations, uh, where they'll have a hearing to determine whether or not your license should be suspended based on that refusal, okay? Let's say they make the decision to suspend your license after you've, you've asked for the hearing. You then can appeal it to the circuit court of the county in which you were pulled over. Uh, and then you can actually have a trial on the issue of whether or not your license should be suspended. But a, uh, an advocate uh, or an attorney that, that knows the law and can walk you through this process if they get you in a situation to stay the suspension and go through this appeals process with you, mm -hmm. if we end up in a situation where the, the uh, driver's uh, driving under the influence charge is ultimately dismissed, there is a very real possibility that your license would never be suspended yeah. because if the DUI is dismissed, there's no longer so a So you have the ability suspension. to delay the suspension until you have your hearing and perhaps maybe can uh, be, be found innocent or not guilty of the crime. Absolutely, and that's so important for so many of our citizens because, you know, a lot of Alabama is in a rural areas, there's not a ton of public transportation, and with a suspended license, you may have to make the decision between, do I lose my job? Yeah. I've got to get to work. That can be a very, very uh, difficult, pro diff difficult problem for one who loses their license as sure. well as their family. Yeah. I know we're about to take a break, but okay. I want to tease the next segment. I okay. want to ask Hunter about uh, blood samples or blood tests, urine samples, uh, and, and whether or not you can refuse to give those under the Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. That, that's good because there were so many steps involved in refusing the breathalyzer, the steps that follow that. That's why it's so important to have an attorney when you do that. So Hunter, stay tuned and you stay right where you are. We're gonna pick this up as we continue talking about criminal law here on this edition of The Attorneys. Also wanna remind you to follow Hollis Wright on all the social media channels on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook as well. And stay with us, we're gonna take a break, but we'll continue this discussion on The Attorneys, next. I'm Josh Wright with the law firm of Hollis Wright, a personal injury law firm, and thank you for watching The Attorneys. We hope you, a friend, or a loved one never needs legal counsel for a case, but if you do, the goal of the show is simple, to provide answers and legal counsel when you need it the most. Your call to the show is free and off air. So if you have questions specific to the show or related to other accident or injury topics, 
call, email, or text us. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube, or go to hollis-right.com and click on the Contact Us button. We know your time is valuable, so thank you for spending it with us and watching The Attorney. Attorneys, proudly sponsored by the law firm of Hollis Wright, are here to serve you. When we started the show eight years ago, my hope was we would be able to do what we do best, which is to help people answer real-world legal-related issues they have in their life. People oftentimes are confronting various legal issues and problems in their lives that range across the gamut of legal practice areas. Bankruptcy, criminal law, family law, just to name a few. And to be able to have a 30-minute platform or format to where we can just cover various legal topics once a week uh, that's obviously the primary focus of the show. That we would be able to use the resources of the many lawyers we have at this law firm to create a plan that had a lasting impact that also gave back to the community at the same time. And I think we've done just that with the attorneys. Thanks for sticking with us. Welcome back to the attorneys as we are talking criminal law. And as we were going to break, Carter, uh, we had talked about refusing a breathalyzer yeah. and the consequences involved in that. But there's some other matters that you wanted to talk about. Yeah, well. you, you see some of this stuff on TV, but I'm kind of fascinated by it because some of this does have real world application. But I'm interested in like blood samples or hair samples, urine samples, things of that nature. D does the Fifth Amendment privilege apply to the refusal to provide that to law enforcement agencies and logistically, like, how does that work out? Well, I would say that it applies uh, in a way. What I mean by that is, is uh, let's say the, someone in law enforcement just asks you for a hair sample, asks you for a blood sample, asks you for a urine sample, something like that. The Fifth Amendment absolutely uh, protects against that. You don't have to voluntarily do these things just because you're asked. However, if a law enforcement officer gets a court order from a judge that compels you to give up that hair sample, that blood sample, then you have to do it. Uh, the Fifth Amendment no longer protects you because a judge has signed off uh, on a court order to get you to uh, hand over that evidence. Okay. But I guess the reason the court would enter such an order is that there's case law out there that would indicate that by giving law enforcement access to your blood, urine, or a hair sample, that would not violate a Fifth Amendment privilege? Absolutely. Okay. It's almost, it, it really works uh, just like a search warrant. I don't have to let law enforcement come in my house and look around, but if they have a search warrant, okay. I do. All right. Let's talk about uh, bailing somebody out or mm -hmm. a bond. We, we oftentimes hear on TV, even on the news, about somebody's bond being set at 100000 or a half million or a million dollars. How does the bonding requirement and the bonding process work exactly? So the, the process essentially goes that uh, someone would be arrested for a crime. Uh, they're taken to county or city jail, wherever that may be. At some point after that arrest, a judge is going to, a judge or magistrate is going to set a bond amount. Let's just work with a hundred thousand dollars, okay? Uh, you have what's called a secured bond, which that is a situation where you can use a bail bondsman. Uh, you would pay that bail bondsman a percentage of the, uh, the set bond amount. Obviously, it's not going to be that a hundred thousand dollar mark, it's going to be a lower percentage of it you give the bail bondsman, or your family gives the bail bondsman that amount of money, they put the overall amount up for your bond, and they bail you out of jail and secure that you'll come back to court. The other way, uh, or another way you can bond, uh, potentially meet bond, is what's called a property bond. A, a property bond. Uh, if you or a loved one has property worth that $100,000 mark, they can put that property up against your bond and uh, essentially it's a promise to the court that this person will show up to court, submit to whatever hearing, sentence, trial there may be, um, and if that person, uh, the person uh, arrested doesn't do that, then that home can be seized. Yeah. Um, the third kind of bond that we see very frequently is what's called a cash bond, which let's say uh, your bond is set at $100,000 and it's a cash bond, 
you've got to have every cent of it to get out of jail. So you literally put cash. your hundred thousand dollars up. And if the person shows up throughout the proceedings, they would get the $100,000 back? That's correct. All right, now with respect to using a bail bondsman, I've heard 10%, is that sort of the customary, if it's a $100,000 bond, you've got to put up 10% or you've got to pay $10,000 to get that bond? That, that is, uh, that's kind of the uh, the baseline norm. Okay. Now that's always subject to, uh, to change depending on if you know someone's not uh, local to the area they've been charged in, there's, you know, you could name a hundred different factors on what could make it move up or down, but 10% is normally pretty standard from what I've seen in my practice. And you're basically paying that as a fee, like you're not getting back that $10,000, correct? That is correct. The bail bondsman will get the money back, he puts up, he or yeah. she puts up to the court. The money you pay the bail, the, the bail bondsman to do that, uh, that, that, that's gone. That's and, their fee to, and, and to get And we've all seen Dog, uh, Dog the Bounty Hunter or whatever. Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of how he comes into the <laughs> picture because uh, as Hunter will attest to, if the person that they put up the $100,000 bond on behalf of doesn't show up to court, th then the bonding company, they get real nervous and anxious, right? Oh yeah, they're, they're, <laughs> if, if that situation uh, comes about, uh, they, you're gonna be found <laughs> and, and they're, gonna, they're, they're gonna get you to where you need to be, so uh, that is... Because that if is, they they don't, they have to pay the court the $100,000. That's right. right. Then they're, yeah. out, they're so out the money they put yeah. up. They're very financially incentivized to go and find this individual. Well, I have to show my ignorance here because I always thought that that 10% that you talked about that you put up to the bail bondsman, if the person shows up, you get that money back. But that's gone. Right. Oh, it's yeah, absolutely. It's I mean, just it's, a fee that you pay for. Wow. It. So okay. <laughs> but this is <laughs> just the price of the service. Yeah. yeah. There's some other questions we want to get to, Hunter, if we would. Um, th this question is, I'm on probation and my probation officer filed a report saying I violated the conditions of my probation. I have a probation revocation hearing coming up. What should I do? Well, in a, a probation revocation hearing, uh, or someone who's on probation, this is somebody that's already been convicted or pled guilty to an offense. They're now on probation uh, with the court. Um, in the situation you're describing, uh, this person's probation officer has said they have done something wrong while on probation, and we need to come to court uh, to decide if they would be revoked and sent to Department of Corrections. A very important thing to note in a probation revocation hearing is you have the right to counsel. Okay, You have the right to an attorney, whether that be retained or appointed, but it is so important that you have counsel there because probation revocation hearings are, are very tricky. They're almost like many trials with very different rules. For instance, in a, a trial, the uh, burden of proof is on uh, the prosecution or the state to prove someone's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. In a probation revocation hearing, that burden remains with the state of the prosecution, but the standard is only that they have to show that the judge is reasonably satisfied that probation has been violated. That's a much lower standard. Mm -hmm. um, another big difference is in a jury trial, um, hearsay testimony or what people uh, are saying out of court that, that you've done, in a jury trial that's not allowed. In a, pro in a probation revocation hearing, it is. Yeah. So there's a lot of differences. Um, the, the format looks, looks very similar, but there's a lot of differences in the rules. And the stakes in a probation revocation hearing are so high because if a judge is reasonably satisfied that a person has violated the terms of their probation, they can be sent uh, to the Department of Corrections to serve out their underlying sentence. Yeah, and is that a meaningful part of your practice, number one? And number two, how often does a probation revocation hearing result in somebody having to go back to the Department of Corrections and serving out their sentence? Are you typically able to manage the situation so that doesn't happen? Well, Carter, uh, first of all, it's a huge part okay. of our practice, huge part of our practice. Um, it's all fact specific based on um, you know whether or not someone would go back and serve their sentence in, uh, uh, in Department of Corrections. A lot of it depends on the underlying offense as well as what the new uh, alleged violation is. For instance, um, if the violation of probation is picking up a new charge or being arrested for, for a new offense while you're on probation, um, that is something that a judge can, can send you back to the Department of Corrections yeah. for the remainder of your sentence. All right, that's Hunter Horton there, Carter Clay. We're discussing criminal law. We're gonna take a break right here. We want you to stay with us and remind you to follow us on our social media channels, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We'll be back right after this.
I'm attorney Carter Clay with Hollis Wright Law Firm. If you've ever been involved in a civil lawsuit or been a witness to an accident, then you may have been asked to give deposition testimony. In this week's Legal 411, we are answering the question, what is a deposition and why am I being asked to give one? Depositions involve the process of a person giving under oath testimony that is outside of court. The person giving deposition testimony is referred to as the deponent. Depositions are taken in the presence of a court reporter and the court reporter records the testimony. After the deposition, the attorneys for the parties received a typed transcript that contains all the questions that were asked by the attorneys as well as the answers given by the deponent. The purpose of taking depositions is to ensure that the attorneys for the parties have a full and complete understanding of the events giving rise to the lawsuit as well as an understanding of the testimony that they can expect to hear from witnesses at trial. Another reason an attorney might want to get deposition testimony is that it allows the attorneys to better prepare for trial and to develop a strategy for presenting the case to a judge or a jury. At trial, the deposition testimony can be used in several ways. First, if a witness on the stand deviates from the deposition testimony, an attorney can use the deposition to impeach the witness. Also, if a witness forgets certain facts or events, the deposition can be used to refresh the witness's recollection. Finally, in some instances when a witness simply cannot attend trial, the trial judge has the authority to allow the deposition testimony to be read to the jury. If you are a party to a lawsuit and are requested to give deposition testimony, your attorney will likely spend a significant amount of time preparing you for the deposition process to put you at ease and make you feel comfortable. Please remember your call, email, or text to the attorneys is free. All of us at Hollis Wright want to help answer your questions on real issues you face. Remember, a competent lawyer will respond to every question you send in. That's our pledge and promise to you. Thanks for watching the attorneys. Welcome back to the attorneys. Thanks so much for being with us. We're talking with Hunter Horton as we are dealing with the, the concept of criminal law and, and what this, what's involved in that. We want to jump right into this question, Hunter, if we will. This question says, I was charged with carrying a pistol without a permit, but now the law changed and Alabama does not require a permit to carry a pistol. Does my case automatically get dismissed? I love that question. What, what, what was illegal is now, now legal, legal, so now do I get my case dismissed. Dismiss, so. <laughs> and you know, it's, it's, a lot of people are actually under that impression. Yeah. I get calls constantly of people saying, hey, they changed this law. I don't have to come back to court, right? <laughs> that is not the case. Uh, if, if anybody out there doesn't know what we're referring to, uh, Alabama, Alabama uh, passed last year what's called, or what's kind of being known as the Permitless Carry Act, uh, which says uh, you, no you no longer have to uh, have a permit uh, to carry a concealed weapon. Um, there's a lot of people that have pending cases out there right now that are charged under that law. Well, the, the crime may no longer be illegal, but if it, you were charged while it was illegal, your case isn't automatically done. You still have to come to court. You still have to go through the process. So if, uh, people that are under the impression that this is just a magic wand that made everything go away, that is not the case. Uh, and if uh, you're under that impression and have made that mistake, um, the, the consequences are, are pretty are, are serious. Do you know or what is your sense of whether or not a court's going to sort of treat the new law as a mitigating factor in terms of these prosecutions that may be pending right now before the courts? How do you expect the judges to handle that? Well, I can tell you uh, it's kind of uncharted territory. This law was passed. It's very new to everyone, both lawyers and judges alike. Um, some courts are treating it more as a mitigating factor. Other courts are treating it more as of a, the time you were, were charged with the offense is, is what carries the day. Um, I expect that we'll get guidance on this at some point in the very near future, but for now, um, you need to remember that your case is still pending. You still have to come before the court, yeah. um, but considering the change in the law with a good advocate and counsel on your side, um, there are arguments to be had as far as this this specific area of law goes. Along those same lines, there's a question. Uh, since Alabama is now a permitless 
carry state, can anyone carry a concealed weapon? See, and uh, if, you, if you focus on the, uh, th the 10,000 foot view, it seems like yes, anyone can. That's not the case. Uh, so prior to uh, the passing of the, con the, the permitless carry law, um, people were allowed to have uh, concealed weapons with a permit. Uh, they were allowed to have concealed weapons in their home concealed weapons in their vehicle if that weapon uh, was in a place no one could reach it, it was locked and unloaded. That was the only situations you could carry a concealed weapon. Now you no longer have that permit requirement. However, that only applies to uh, people without uh, violent criminal convictions on their record, people that have been convicted of any degree of domestic violence charge in the past, and people who aren't uh, subject to a protection from abuse order. So if you're someone that has a, a violent criminal conviction on the record, someone with a domestic violence conviction on the record, or someone who's subject to a protection from abuse order, this law does not apply to you. You cannot carry a concealed weapon, or any weapon for that matter, and if you are caught doing so, you could be charged under what attorneys often refer to as the certain persons forbidden law, which is actually a felony offense. Yeah. So this is not a carte blanche, anybody and everybody can carry a concealed weapon. There are people out there in our society um, that this law does not apply to, and if they are uh, caught with a concealed weapon or with a weapon in their possession, uh, they, they could very well be prosecuted. So you better know those exceptions, that, that's for sure. Uh, we got about a minute left for you to talk a little bit about expungement. People often want to know whether or not they can get a conviction off of their record or not. Well, unpack that a little bit for us. Sure. Basically, the, uh, uh, the main thing you need to know is five years ago, if you had a uh, misdemeanor or felony conviction, whether that be from a guilty plea or being found guilty to trial, on your record, it stuck. There was no way to get rid of it. Uh, you could not expunge that. In 2021, state legislature passes the uh, Alabama Redeemer Act, opened up a lot of doors for, mem for, for folks out there that have got these uh, prior convictions on their record to potentially get that expunged. And it's critically important from an employment standpoint and just other aspects in life to give people the opportunity uh, to be able to get their, their record expunged because it just helps them sort of uh, reassimilate into society and live a normal kind of civilized life. But Art, I know we're about to close this out, but Hunter has been a wealth of information. We're going to have him back on. He's going to be a regular guest from this point forward because he did an outstanding job, and there's a lot more to cover in mm -hmm. the criminal law context. We're just now scratching the surface. Sign him up. Already That's got him exactly down there. Right. Remember the name, folks. That is Hunter Horton. Thanks so much for being with us. And Carter, always thank you. Always does a great job when he's um, here with us on The Attorneys. And thank you for joining us. We've got another great show lined up for you next week. Same place, same time. Make sure you join us. We're looking forward to seeing you on The Attorneys. Thanks for watching The Attorneys, sponsored by Hollis Wright.